Okay, I'm going to start broadcasting now. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Laura Barnes, Executive Director of the Great Lakes Regional Pollution Prevention Roundtable. Presentation slides for today's webinar are available on the handouts pane in your GoToWebinar control panel. That's a new feature that uh, GoToWebinar added recently. Um, they're also available for download at um, www.glipper.org on the meetings page. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Madeline Chochi of the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and Jolene Parker of Minneapolis's Linden Hills Co-op. They're going to talk about MPCA's BPA and thermal paper project and, how re and discuss how retailers can reduce their risk of exposure to BPA and thermal paper. If you have questions during the presentation, please submit them using the questions pane on the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, there are several places where we'll pause to take questions and comments. And Madeline, now I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Do I need to click on show my screen? Um, I am seeing your screen. Okay. So just, yeah, click on slideshow and it looks like you're, you're, you should be ready to go. All right, terrific. Um, well, hello everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you, Laura and to Glipper for hosting uh, this webinar today. And I'd like to thank the uh, EPA Region 5 for the funding through their pollution prevention program that supported the work which led to today's webinar. Um, so Jolene and I are going to tag team the presentation today. I will start with a little bit of context and describe the issue. Jolene then is going to talk about what her store has done. And then I'll step back in to finish up with the strategies for action and tips for handling thermal paper. And hopefully we'll have time to allow for a few questions at the end of each section. Um, so I've been at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency for eight years. It's a state level environmental government agent agency and our mission is to protect and improve the environment and enhance human health. My work at the Pollution Control Agency is to develop projects and policies that prevent waste and toxic pollution. And I want to be clear at the outset that I'm not a chemist or a toxicologist. My role here is really to take complex information that's out there about our environment and try and translate it into plain language and to build partnerships and projects uh, based on that information um, that can promote good changes. Listeners to this webinar today probably have heard somewhere that there's BPA in thermal paper receipts. Whether you've read it in a peer-reviewed journal article or in Newsweek or in the New York Times or seen something on Facebook. Um, this presentation is for those of you who care about the issue to provide you some tools and some knowledge to make the right decision for you to do something about it if you choose. Um, I'm hoping that on this there are cashiers or maybe you're someone whose son or daughter is a cashier. Maybe you wait tables. Um, maybe you're a pregnant woman. Maybe you're a business owner or a point of sale manager um, or you do environmental health and safety. Um, I'm, and, and you're wondering if this is an issue where you should be taking some action on it. Or maybe you are like me, someone in government or an NGO who's trying to provide assistance and information to others. So whatever your business, I hope this will be helpful. And if you are a business person, uh, whether you have a one register coffee shop or a grocery store or a bookstore or you're part of a national retailer, um, you can take action that will make a measurable difference. And really, why wouldn't you? Um, my question is, why should simple, everyday transactions add toxic chemicals to our body burden and to our environment? So what is the BPA doing in receipt paper anyway? Um, just a quick review for anybody who doesn't understand or doesn't, hasn't been familiarized with this. Um, it's in thermal paper as a developer. And this simple uh, schematic just shows you that in thermal paper, there's the base layer of paper. And then there's a coating on top. And that includes the colorless dye and then um, a solvent layer. And the BPA, in this case, is the activator or the developer. And when it runs through the hot stylus, 
that developer then will activate the uh, die and the image would appear. And how can you tell if what you're using is thermal paper? It's really simple. Just rub a coin on it. The friction will cause heat and activate the dye and discolor it. If what you're using is regular bond paper, old-fashioned paper, um, when you rub the coin on it, nothing will happen. So the presentation today is the result of work the PCA undertook over the last two years, having learned that BPA and later bisphenol S, or BPS, are widely used as a developer in thermal paper receipts. We worked with several businesses, mostly smaller hospitality and grocery stores, some retail, um, to test the papers that they were using and to discover the opportunities and the barriers to making changes to their systems to reduce paper use, and to find out how much chemical prevention they might get from taking different actions. We at the Pollution Control Agency, we're taking a pollution prevention approach to issues like this, and we encourage action on a voluntary basis. The MPCA at this time isn't taking any regulatory action on this issue, though there are communities in the United States that have prohibited BPA thermal papers, um, Suffolk County in New York and the state of Connecticut. Um, but it turns out that that sort of action, while well-meaning, given the way the industry works, doesn't necessarily ensure that safer papers will be used in its place. So why would that be the case? Why would banning the BPA thermal papers not be a good answer? Or why not just switch to a BPA-free paper? So here's this quote by H.L. Mencken that I love. To every problem, there's a solution that is simple, clean, and wrong. <laughs> and in this case, banning BPA thermal paper is one of those wrong solutions. When the paper manufacturers take out a developer, like BPA, they have to put another one in. And in the case of thermal paper, the main substitute turned out to be bisphenol S, BPS, a close chemical cousin of BPA. And early toxicological studies have shown um, that BPS is endocrine active in very similar ways to BPA in um, animals and in tissues and cells. So I'll just repeat that. The studies are showing that the BPS is endocrine active in very much the same way that BPA is. So they're different, but very similar chemicals. So a paper labeled BPA may have been labeled that way out of very good intentions. Um, I know that there's a Midwest paper manufacturer that early on when the BPA was turned out to be a problem, um, they moved right away to put BPS in, thinking that it was a good step. Um, or there may be manufacturers out there that intentionally labeled papers BPA-free when they knew better, so it might have been a greenwashing case. In either case, it takes advantage, this BPA-free label, it takes advantage of our human, very human tendency to interpret the phrase BPA-free as safer. But really, BPA-free tells you nothing about what is in it. So what is the new developer that was put in? So BPA-free just means free of BPA. That's it. Not safer, not free of chemicals, or not well-tested. It doesn't mean that it's been well-tested. So in most cases, the BPA-free means BPS functionally. Um, as the news of BPA broke, manufacturers were quick to move to papers um, uh, to try and change the formulations in their papers and shifted pretty quickly, but didn't necessarily get a great vetting of all the alternative chemicals out there. In the paper testing that we did over the last two years, um, we tested 26 paper samples, and all of them had either BPA or BPS in them, and more than half of them it turned out to be BPS. So uh, the point is that there are really two main developers in use at the moment. I'll talk about alternatives later in the webinar, but for now, just in the market in general, there are two main de developers that are being used. So the EPA um, did an extensive evaluation in, in the last, it came out probably two years ago, I'm guessing now. The EPA did an extensive evaluation of 19 alternatives to bisphenol A and concluded that none of them were clearly safer 
and that included the BPS in their evaluation. Um, and in many cases, the alternatives that they were evaluating just didn't have very much data that they could use for their evaluation. So when I talk about BPA here in the next few slides, I just wanted you to understand that um, a lot more research has been done on BPA than on BPS. But it seems very likely to us that BPS will continue to show the similar sorts of effects uh, in the environment and in animals and in human cells. So this is what we call a regrettable substitution, an out of the frying pan into the fire kind of situation. Um, and this is why we're looking for ways to prevent the use of the paper altogether and why we promoted E or electronic receipts in the end. So just quickly about BPA, one of the highest volume chemicals produced in the world, uh, over 13 billion pounds of it globally. Um, it shows up in humans, all humans, including fetuses. Um, it's found, we've found it in Minnesota in our groundwater near landfills. Um, it shows up with other endocrine active chemicals in the sediment, the, the sediment under the, at the floor of the Mississippi River all through the state and in about 35 to 45 percent of our lakes, as well as near our wastewater treatment plants. And though BPA dissolves pretty quickly in water, um, there is so much of it, and it's always being replenished in the environment and in us by our exposures. So it's what we call pseudo-persistent. It's not that the chemical lasts itself in the environment so long or lasts in our bodies, but because it's always there, it's as because it's always being replenished, it's as if it's always there. Some of the impacts of BPA, um, it's implicated in human and animal obesity, uh, definitely reproductive issues, attention disorder issues, and other developmental and neurological issues. Um, its impacts on aquatic species are very similar. Um, we see fertility issues, reproductive problems, especially feminization of um, the males in the species um, and neurological problems. And what are people doing about it? Well, in Minnesota, um, it is one of our priority chemicals, which means it is targeted for reduction. Um, and um, uh, it's also recently been added to California's Prop 65 list of chemicals, and those are chemicals known to the state to either cause cancer or reproductive toxicity. So that was just added, in fact, this year. Um, the FDA has banned BPA from children's bottles and cups and infant formula, each time it did saying that it was because the industry had already moved away from using that um, chemical in the bottles. Um, they didn't say anything about the safety of it. So the FDA has so far steadfastly said that BPA is safe in food container applications. However, in Minnesota, we were a little less certain, and it has been banned from children's bottles and sippy cups here for safety reasons. Uh, in, the, in the U.S. as well, the EPA is considering rulemaking right now to identify BPA on the concern list as a substance that may present an unreasonable risk of injury to the environment. They're not yet doing that for humans, but the EPA has acknowledged that there are some recent approaches to studying the chemical that looks at very low doses when we get very little of the chemical at a time that have um, called into question some of the judgments that have been made about BPA safety in the past. And so um, some authorities are taking more action. So, so what we know, um, we know that cashiers have more BPA than other people in their blood and their urine. Um, those who handle thermal receipts occupationally have higher levels in their system, higher than um, teachers, higher than office workers, higher than the general public. That exposure is estimated to be about 50 to 70 times, 75 times higher than for the general population. Um, so just to give you an idea of what that means, and we're talking about very minute amounts, the daily intake of BPA through your skin, through the dermal, what they call dermal skin absorption from handling of papers, is 17.5 nanograms for the general population 
but 1,300 nanograms for the occupationally exposed individuals. So it's much higher. Um, but these values are still pretty low compared to what exposure we get through our diet if we eat a lot of canned foods because BPA is in cans. So just to put it in, in kind of relative balance there. Um, among paper products, thermal receipt papers contribute to more than 98% of the exposure. So to the extent that you're getting any BPA from paper, it's really mostly coming from thermal papers. So, um, so the, the exposure that you're getting as a, as a cashier um, is certainly more than other occupations and more than the general public but less than what has so far been deemed to be sort of a safe daily exposure. Um, the European Chemicals Agency Risk Assessment Committee just last month in June released an opinion that the risk for workers handling thermal paper is not adequately controlled. They have identified it as an issue for, um, for workers who are handling it. So why do cashiers have more? As I said, uh, the chemical on the paper is unbound. It's just a coating on the surface of the paper. It rubs off quite easily and is transferred right onto and then through your skin. Um, and this explains why paper money also has a lot of these chemicals on it too. Um, because where do you keep your receipts? With your money in your wallet. And so the chemicals rub right off onto the paper money. And you can think about other occupations then that would handle a lot of type, a lot of this type of paper. Um, librarians, I think wait staff, airline staff perhaps because of the luggage tags or boarding passes, potentially police officers who are writing tickets. Um, what we don't know, we don't know a lot about what amount of BPA or BPS is problematic for us. The science is really unsettled, and that's one of the reasons that we take a preventive approach. Um, traditionally, sort of risk or hazard assessment has looked at chemicals um, that the dose makes the poison. So, some sub, sub, excuse me, some substances would take a lot to be toxic, and some would just take a small amount. But generally, the expected relationship has been the more you get, the worse the effect. However, there have been really recent studies on BPA that show a different kind of relationship emerging in some cases where a low dose, similar to those found in the environment or through exposure through some, something like thermal paper, but the doses that we get in our daily living actually can cause a bigger effect on tissues at a certain point in development. So it becomes about a, a sort of odd relationship. Sometimes it's a lower dose, but at a certain timing of development of the organism. And sometimes repeated low doses can cause an effect that a single large dose of that amount doesn't. So in this case, it's, um, this is why the, there's uncertainty in the science. Um, and why, again, we're looking at a, at a preventive approach because we just aren't certain yet. So who are we most concerned about? Um, we are concerned about, and who do these low doses matter for? Um, they matter for developing brains when the neurons are getting set, the brain cells are getting set and finding their way around in there. We, it matters for developing hormone systems and reproductive systems. So we, we worry about cashiers who have the occupational exposure. We worry about fetuses that absorb BPA through the mother's um, exposure, um, infants, for their developing systems, boys and girls, young children, um, adolescents in puberty, boys or girls, um, we, women of childbearing age, so women who may be pregnant or getting pregnant or hope to be pregnant, um, pregnant women or those who are breastfeeding um, because of their direct line to the fetuses and infants. We also worry about the environment and the environmental loading too. Um, whether paper is recycled or landfilled, whether the thermal paper is recycled or landfilled, it can get into the environment. The chemicals on it can. So, um, so what about alternative papers? 
um, paper manufacturers don't have to divulge chemical ingredients. Uh, so it's hard to know what chemicals are in a given thermal paper. But we do know that these papers are really chemically intensive. Manufacturers can change their formulations, and they never need to tell their distributors. Though so hopefully, if manufacturers are making specific claims about a paper being BPA-free or phenol-free, um, bisphenol A or bisphenol S, um, hopefully they'll be honest about that. We did run into one case, though, where a business thought they were buying a BPA-free paper, but the paper turned out to be BPA. <laughs> So there are no certifications right now that cover this substance or these products. Um, so it's really hard to be sure always of what you're getting. And the question always is, if they don't have phenol, like BPA or BPS, what do they have? Well, Apsian Papers in Wisconsin has a new paper on the market, which is using ascorbic acid, which they are colloquial, colloquially calling vitamin C, because that's the common name of ascorbic acid. Um, this paper is looking to be free of other chemicals that were evaluated by the EPA. Um, I haven't been able to see any toxicology tests on this um, paper yet, um, but ascorbic acid and vitamin C have been used by photographers in the past as developers, so um, it may be that this is going to turn out to be a good paper. Um, but as I said, it's untested right now, and I know there are other chemicals in it. So we're hopeful, but looking for more testing. There are other phenol-free papers on the market, but again, my question is always, what is in it? Um, it might be Pergafast 201, which was one of the chemicals tested in the EPA's evaluation. Um, this chemical is still pretty persistent. It hangs on in the environment. It doesn't dissolve and has pretty high aquatic toxicity and environmental impacts, as well as some impacts on human development. Um, urea urethane, which is another one that's being used in papers on the market, um, there's really not been much testing done on it. It looks like it might have a lighter impact, um, but again, the, it, it, the testing just has not been done. So. Uh, right now, it's all sort of on guesses based on what the chemical looks like. That's how they're saying that it might have less of an impact. The Apsion paper wasn't on the market yet when the EPA did their study, so it wasn't evaluated. Um, we did test, the PCA did test a phenol-free paper, and it actually tested with a very, very tiny bit of BPA, much less than a typical BPA paper, but it did actually have a little bit. Whether that was intentionally added or a contamination in the process, we don't know. Um, um, but, but there it was. So the market is changing really quickly. New papers are being um, developed and put on the market very quickly, and there's just not much definitive clarity yet on the toxicity of these new papers. So. This is the point. It's hard to know what chemicals there are, and the manufacturers don't necessarily tell you. So there's still going to be built-in uncertainty and ambiguity. So what about plain old bond paper and using an ink cartridge? Um, ink and paper, they carry their own impacts um, in making ink and making paper. And in today's market, there's just a really good way of preventing uh, the waste and preventing all of those impacts, and it's the electronic receipt. Um, so we like the, the electronic receipt option quite a lot. Um, I think that these eliminate the need for the paper altogether. Um, they prevent the need for any chemical developers. They have a host of additional benefits. They're really easily organized. They're always readable. The business can keep merchant copies or records of the sale. They've been in use for quite some time. Apple, um, it was a very early adopter of using e-receipts. Many department stores have followed suit. Um, and with the advent of some really simple systems like Square and Shopkeep that are kind of tablet-based and inexpensive, really any small business now can access e-receipts. Um, food trucks, coffee shops, even farmers market vendors, um, kind of you name it. So. 
Um, and we saw in our project that most POS point of sale systems have updated their systems with an e-receipt option. So we're really just trying to push along a wave that's already happening. When we approached businesses, we were pretty much investigating primarily what it would take for employees to change their paper handling, um, their paper handling um, behavior, or for businesses to make changes to their standard operating procedures or to begin offering, uh, offering e-receipt. So at this point, Jolene is going to talk about what her business did. And then I'll come back to talk about other specific steps that you can take. Um, but before Jolene starts, I'd be happy to take a couple of questions if there are any. Laura, are you there? Are there questions? Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, I can hear you now. Good. Okay. Yes, I can okay. hear you. Something went screwy with my audio for a second. Okay. There is a question. Um, somebody wants to know if there's any information on the BPA, BPS combustion products produced when thermal paper is burned. Uh, that's a really good question, and we have, tr we have looked into that. Um, I have made several calls around the country and to chemists. Um, I called the... Um, steel Recycling in Association, and I have not been able to find good, um, good information yet. Um, in can linings, the steel recyclers tell me that the BPA is completely destroyed at the temperatures in which steel is recycled and it's incinerated there and destroyed. Um, we suspect that standard solid waste incinerators are probably pretty good at destroying it, um, but we haven't yet made a definitive, set definitive guidance on how to dispo, best dispose of the paper. Okay. I'm, I'm typing in the answer so that I have a record later also. Okay. <laughs> um, there is another question. How would you suggest trying to transition into e-receipts and doing so on a university level? Ah, that's a great question, and um, I'm hoping that through the next bit of the webinar, we'll be able to answer that. We're going to go into um, some of the barriers and opportunities and some of the experiences Jolene had in making her change. I realize that's not the same as a university, um, but we do have, I will be talking about a university bookstore, for instance. So I'm going to hold that question and hopefully answer it. Back. Okay. And then have there any, been any reports on the human health aspects of ongoing exposure? Well, that's part of that unsettled science um, and, and the repeated dose question. Um, so yes, there are certainly studies out there that are looking at uh, long-term chronic low-dose exposure. Um, and I, I, as I said before, I'm not a toxicologist, so I'm not going to make any definitive statements about that. But many of them are showing, um, are showing these long-term effects. Okay, and are some of the, the links to those studies available on the MPCA project website? I mean, do you... Where the, yeah, where the links to the studies would be found, we have a report that we issued, um, and a lot of the research that we consulted for our work um, are listed in the reference list at the back of that report, which is right on our webpage right now. Okay, and the just for for audience mm -hmm. information. Um, the link to the website, to the MPCA study website is available on the Glipper website right along with the, the uh, link to the presentation slides. So it's and really it'll be easy at to the end to. of Yep, and it'll be yep. on the last slide of the presentation too. Great, and uh, yeah, and it'll also go out in the follow-up email. So I think we're covered. <laughs> okay, so um, I think we can, that's the last question. So we can move along Great. to Jolie. Great, thank you guys so much. Um, so to give you a little bit of background, Linden Hills is a cooperatively run grocery store. And we've been open since 1976. And we focus on natural, organic, and local products. At this point in time, we have annual sales of about $13.5 million. Um, I personally have been the customer service manager since 2005. 
slowly transitioning into operations manager simply because I enjoy taking on challenges and working to improve our processes and procedures. We have an outside company that we work with to help us with our IT needs, so there's not much that's done here in-house. And they primarily deal with our server and our email accounts. Um, we have Microsoft Office 365 set up for the in-store use. And then in 2009, I did research on a new point of sale system. And we really just needed updated technology and potential inventory and um, costing out margin technology. So I ended up choosing a POS system called ECR Software, and it's a catapult system. Uh, when we were switching the system, I went to a week-long intensive training to learn more about how to set up the POS and how to use the functions that were available. But ultimately, we don't have anyone in-house who has a ton of training on all the behind-the-scenes programming part of the POS software. Um, ECR software does have an amazing tech support team, and I end up relying on them quite a bit when I'm exploring options or have questions that pop up about the capabilities of the system. Um, so a little bit about being a cooperative. It is a business model that has proven to be successful at blending and meeting value-centric and profit goals. So this approach allows us to make decisions that are healthy for our member owners, employees, and the community. We have an ENDS policy that the Board of Directors has set up for us, and our ENDS policy um, has four bullet points. One, to provide healthful choices for our members and shoppers, to offer, promote, and use sustainable, earth-friendly products, to build community within Linden Hills and neighboring communities, and then also to encourage education and activism on sustainability, health, and nutrition-related issues. So when Madeline first approached me to be part of this study, it was an absolute no-brainer that we'd like to participate because it met three parts of our ENDS policy. We have environmentally conscious staff that had already been asking questions about BPA in canned foods and a few folks that had read and heard about BPA in our receipts and how they should handle that. So the first phase of the project consisted of um, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency actually testing our paper. We found out that our paper contained 57 micrograms per square centimeter of BPA and had no BPS present. This means that our paper is about 1.4% BPA by weight. So we have several different meeting venues that happen on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis with our staff here at the store. And I started talking about the project at these meetings as soon as we were getting our paper tested. Some of the large attended meetings made it seem like I was discussing pure doom and trying to scare our employees. So that wasn't quite the right tack that we wanted to take. So um, the other part of it is that I obviously still need to have our cashiers hand out receipts as needed. And so I ended up doing some more research and started talking about it with employees at smaller meetings. So like the cashier department meeting um, we would open up dialogue about what we could do instead of simply discussing all the negative things that I had learned. This resulted in a much more passionate employee group, and the cashiers especially have become experts. As expected with our team of people here, um, the employees started thinking outside the box and trying to help figure out what we could do next. Almost immediately, we learned from our POS company that they had an option to not print a receipt at all. And that feature could be turned on by simply clicking a button inside the program. About 73% of our sales are to members of our co-op or reciprocating co-ops. So they have a member number that is linked to an account with their preferences. We started asking folks if they wanted their receipt. If they said no, we'd switch that member to opt out of receipts. That means that nothing would actually print out of the printer at all. A coworker, realizing that several of our customers are from other co-ops, suggested we automatically opt out these co-ops from getting receipts at all. It's obviously really easy for us to reprint a receipt if needed. And so as soon as we started that process, we realized that we had been using about 800 rolls of 220-foot paper in a year. And that simple change to not printing receipts has reduced our usage to about 300 rolls of paper a year. Um, that is a reduction of about 170 pounds of paper waste and a reduction of 2 pounds of BPA. As Madeline had said earlier, BPA is measured in humans in micrograms or milligrams. And so this reduction means that we have reduced an estimated 910 
million micrograms per year. And that is a number that we are super excited about here at the co-op. We felt like we could do more. So once again, we turned to our POS provider to discuss e-receipt options. We found out that this was already a feature that was available to us. So we were pretty excited about being able to turn that on. I did understand that we needed to have a secure internet connection. And again, again it would simply just be a matter of flipping the switch, so to speak. For me, not being an IT person, I thought, OK, I've turned on e-receipts. Let's see how this works. I set myself up as a guinea pig, and I tried transactions and started failing. Nothing was being sent to me, and I couldn't quite figure out what was going on. I would pull up reports that would come through our POS provider. Um, there's a report that would just tell us basically what e-receipts had been sent and if they had gone through. And I could see that we had error messages, so I needed to reach out to my POS provider. I opened up tickets with them. I spoke with another local co-op that has ECRS as their provider, and I worked with my IT person who was only here twice a month. Obviously, I still had my normal business to run and my normal daily work, so this part was extremely difficult for me because I, like, I really like quick resolutions. Um, trying to coordinate our IT folks that don't know anything about our point of sale, and then trying to coordinate our POS provider with people that are only here twice a month and um, working on our setups in-house was obviously my biggest challenge that I ended up, ended up seeing. So we, this took me several months to get figured out, and in the end, we found out that we needed to get a separate internet provider for a de dedicated email account. Um, Microsoft wasn't compatible with what we were trying to do. I also needed to have our IT person open specific port numbers for communication to happen. And I found a very inexpensive, cooperatively owned email host that helped us out. The cost for this was just under, under $60 for the entire year for us um, to implement our own personal email account that could send the e-receipts. So finally, we had success in e-receipts. Uh, the next big challenge came in communication for us. I wanted to share our story with our members, and I wanted to shout it from the mountaintops as soon as possible. But even though everything about the situation was in line with our ENDS policy and what we're trying to do as an organization, I found a disconnect with our marketing manager. So it took several months for there to be something in our newsletter, and that article ended up being about paper reduction, nothing really truly about BPA and the impact that it has on our bodies and the environment. It took time for me to convince marketing that I should also have signs at my registers asking people to sign up for e-receipts. Since the study has happened, we have an entirely new marketing team, and the new folks are excited about making an impact and shouting our messages with me. The retail environment is in constant flux with new folks coming and going, and because of this, I found that if I want to maintain a knowledgeable and passionate group of employees when it comes to BPA, I need to really make sure that this information is an important part of their training. So we now discuss BPA receipts and alternatives during orientation with cashiers. There's a page that I've added to our employee handbook discussing BPA receipts. We've also added in best practices, um, which you heard earlier, not crumpling receipts, um, not necessarily even folding them when a customer has a long one, not to use alcohol-based sanitizers and lotions, and to not store the receipts in your pockets, purse, or work aprons. I provide the information that we've gotten from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency with case studies and facts about BPA. And during training, we instead focus on ways that we can try to control the amount of BPA paper usage that we have here in the store and how we can talk to our customers about signing up for e-receipt. We still don't have many folks that have signed up for e-receipt, but we're still working on it. The folks that have signed up are super passionate about e-receipts, and they notice that they don't get their email within about two minutes that they, that they need the receipt. Um, our next steps are to have a campaign to sign up members for e-receipts. And this will be done primarily through the cashiers and store signage. Our big push will be in September when our business is again ramping up. And I believe that we've come a long way. And with the help of our marketing team and continued discussions with employees, that we have no doubt that we're going to be able to continue to shrink our BPA paper usage. Thank you. Is there any questions for me? Um, I have, well, we have the one question that's pending that Madeline hasn't answered yet. Oh, um, somebody wants to know if you have determined cost savings yet. 
Well, the tricky thing for us was that our receipt paper was actually free because we work with an organization that would post um, advertising on the back of the receipts. So our receipt paper has been free for us um, for a long time. So actually, it's, uh, we have a cost added with e-receipts, which is just the $60 email account um, added on. Okay, and then um, I, this one came in right at as we were transitioning from Madeline to you. So I'm not sure who this is really for, but uh, this may actually be a better question for Madeline. Um, how do you suggest common items that come into contact with receipts are cleaned? Things like wallets and credit cards. Hmm. Um, well, it's very water soluble. So, I mean, a simple, a simple rinsing off is probably going to be your best bet. Um, if you can wipe it down with something damp, um, okay. you're probably going to be able to get it off. Okay, and then somebody else wants to know what the name of the email receipt company is that you're using. The company that we use to get a hosted email account is called Gaia Host, G-A-I-A. Okay. One word, Gaia Host? Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. Are there any other questions for Jolene before we continue? Um, are customers able to look up their e-receipts by name? Somebody wants to know. Yeah, so our provider allows us to, um, we can actually look it up right while they're standing at any of the registers. We can just simply type in their member number and it will pull up their history. And we can visibly see um, okay. each transaction that they have. And it's actually a really cool feature that we can touch items from the transaction to do a return if we need to. Um, but yes, we can pull them up and we can also pull them up in the back office where we could actually print it out on um, regular card paper mm -hmm. and um, not use the receipts. We can't reprint the receipt after it's been uh, more than a day. So it would just go back onto regular paper. Okay, great. Okay. Any other questions for Jolene before we continue? Um, oh, somebody asked if you required receipts for returns. It kind of depends. I think um, because we're a grocery store, we don't have a lot of high-end stuff, and we know that a lot of products do go bad. And so our return policy is um, basically that they would get store credit if they don't have a receipt. Like I said, about 70% of our customers are members, and so we have access to look up their history. Okay. So. Okay, any other questions for Jolene? Okay, I think we'll move on to Madeline and um, we'll have time for questions at the end too for both speakers. Okay, all right, sounds good. Um, so I'm gonna head into the sort of more concrete tips uh, and results section now. If you are an employee and you're interested in this issue, there are some very concrete things you can do to handle receipts differently in your job while you are, while you are at the register to minimize your exposure. Um, so obviously because it's going through your skin, the idea is just to limit the amount of time um, and that the paper is in contact with your skin. So you want to minimize that friction or wipe action. Um, I see sometimes cashiers pull off a receipt and then run their hand down it to straighten it out, keep it from curling, and set it down in front of um, the customer. And I always want to say, don't do that. <laughs> um, so if you could use something like a pen or a chopstick or something else to help do the uncurling thing instead of your hand, I think that's really helpful. Um, I don't like to see people crumpling them up. I think often I see cashiers, I think they become quite an observer of cashier behavior and they will tear it off and if the person says no I don't want it the customer then the 
cashier will crumple it up before putting it into the trash can or recycling bin. And so avoid that behavior. If um, somebody, if you've already printed it and they don't want it, just drop it into the bin. Don't crumple it up. Handle with just two fingers um, to minimize the number of fingers that are holding it. Minimize the grip pressure that you're using. And then as Jolene mentioned, um, water, grease, hand lotions, so greased from fast food like french fries, anything like that, hand lotions, and even the alcohol-based uh, hand sanitizers, all of those things actually facilitate the transfer of BPA from the paper uh, into your skin. So you want to try and have your skin be free of those things when you're handling the papers. Um, that said, you should definitely wash your hands before you eat something. Um, that will get the uh, BPA off of it, off of them before you eat. And then the folded printed side in, uh, unless you're using double-sided thermal paper that can be printed on both sides, you're probably using a single-sided paper that's coated just on one side. And it turns out that the paper has probably 10 times the BPA on the coated side than on the um, uncoated side. So it helps to fold the printed side in on itself, fold the BPA or BPS side in on itself. And then what you're handling is that lower BPA uh, surface, which is good and also good for the person you're handling the receipt to. Um, in addition, uh, we never want you to hand receipts to babies or toddlers. I do see that happen. Or uh, a mom who is busy will take the receipt and hand it to the toddler as a plaything. Um, you might in your store want to consider giving pregnant or nursing cashiers some feasible means of minimizing their exposure. Perhaps temporarily they could move to an alternate job function or something. Um, I don't like to see the thermal paper receipts being placed directly on food during preparation. Um, I have seen in kind of assembly line kitchens, sometimes especially with pizza places, the order on the thermal paper will go down the line and actually be placed on the pizza and move to the next person in line. Um, so if we can keep the thermal papers away from the uh, pizza and ideally not having the people who are building the food, assembling the food, also handling the thermal papers, that would be a great improvement. Um, and finally, if you're a wait staff, if you work at a bar, for instance, um, don't use the moisture on the side of the bar glass um, to hold the receipt. <laughs> I see that happen a lot too where they just tap it onto a wet glass um, and again that's um, going to facilitate the transfer of the BPA um, onto people's hands. So those are some tips for just behavioral changes that can be made pretty easily. Uh, steps that businesses can take. There are a few different approaches that businesses can take. You heard about Jolene's experience um, actually being able to just turn on some systems that already existed within their existing POS system. Um, so that's a great option. If you need to switch to a new POS system that has an uh, e-receipt, that's great. Um, you could change your standard operating procedures. And an example of that is what the Linden Hills Co-op did first, which was to just ask people if they wanted their receipt or not and if they don't want the receipt, not printing it. So that's an operational change. And certainly sharing the behavior tips with staff, um, I think, are, is, is really an important um, thing for employers to do. Um, so we found some terrific results with this. And as far as I know, I haven't seen these, this sort of study done anyplace else yet. So I think we may be the first that, that have, have done this. If other people have looked at the results from certain actions, I would love to know uh, what results they're getting. But we found that when you ask, do you want your receipt, and if you don't print the unwanted receipt, that you can see generally we saw a 30 to 37 percent reduction in paper use and then chemical use. Um, the 8 percent there is reflective of one particular business that we worked with um, where people had already been rejecting receipts, and so they had a lower drop when they really started to ask. Do you want your receipt? Um, don't print the merchant copy 
if you already keep it electronically. Someone asked about the university, and this, this step came into play at the university bookstore that we worked with, where um, they had been keeping electronic copies, but they had also been printing out their merchant copies um, for kind of double checking or backup records. And when I met with them, they said, well, that's something we really don't need to do. And then it occurred to her that those merchant copies actually had been handled by employees not one time, but three different times because of their operations in sort of double checking things and moving them from one place to another. They would count through the receipts. And so people were kind of swiping through those receipts um, three different times. So that could be up to a 50% reduction if the merchant copies are the same size receipt as the customer copy. Um, if you can switch to an e-receipt system, depending on your situation and your store um, and people's interest in using the e-receipt system, you could see up to a 90% reduction. Um, we saw that in a coffee shop that put in um, I think they put in a system called ShopKeep, um, and they found that once they did that, almost nobody requested a paper receipt. They were happy to get the e-receipt or to decline it, but do that on the iPad. Um, you may want to look at shortening receipts. Um, if, if you're interested, you should Google comedian Jimmy Kimmel on receipt links. Jimmy Kimmel did a great piece where he actually took one pharmacy chain to task about their really long receipts. Uh, and to their credit, they totally responded and they have since shortened their receipts by 25% and have promised to go further now and they're going to put their discount coupons, which is what was making the receipts so long, onto people's loyalty cards instead of printing them. So that's actually a huge change. Thank you, Jimmy Kimmel, for that. Um, this strategy wouldn't necessarily reduce employee exposure because they'd still be handling a receipt, but it certainly would reduce the overall chemical use and the amount of paper that uh, is needed. Um, and then other options that I don't like as well, but I am going to mention here. One is the double-sided thermal paper. Um, there's really no chemical reduction in doing that because though the paper receipts may be half as long because now you can print on both sides. Both sides have chemicals, so there's no reduction. Um, you will see a paper reduction. I think it's going to be harder for employees to reduce their exposure because it's on both sides of the paper. Um, and then there is the option um, to choose a different paper. Um, again, I'm sure you've, you've picked up by now that I'm not a big fan of, of that option because of the uncertainty out there. But for those who really want to take a step amid some uncertainty, um, it could be justifiable to seek a paper that has no phenols in it, the bisphenol A or bisphenol S. Um, and if you know what your trade-off you're making, um, you know, if you know you're moving to a paper that has a high persistence in the environment or aquatic toxicity, but you really want to um, do something for your employees, um, this could be a justifiable step to take. Um, and in fact, we worked with uh, Best Buy. Um, the retailer is headquartered here. And they were interested in making a change based on what they knew and what they had read. And they did choose to move to a non-phenol paper for their North American operations, um, which was a tremendous step. And because they are so big and use so much paper, um, their change resulted in about a three and a half ton reduction of BPS, which is what had been in their paper. So um, again, we have, you know, it, it, they still have paper and they still have chemicals on that paper, um, but they have made a very justifiable and conscious decision in this regard. And um, hopefully we'll be moving towards more electronic options as well in the future. So they've been a great partner. Some of our results, um, just you can see quickly here, we had eight, eight small businesses that really did a good job of measuring their pre and post changes. And we found sort of a 10 to 30% reduction. If um, other project partners had taken a little bit more action, I think we would have seen additional reductions. Um, 
and we estimate that if if based on US thermal paper use estimates that if everybody took some action and could get in that 10 to 30 percent paper reduction um, area or ballpark that we'd be looking at somewhere between 219 and 650 tons of um, reduced endocrine active chemical use which would be terrific. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on barriers and opportunities. I think what Jolene talked about really captured a lot of that. The question of how to communicate to employees and to customers is um, something you'll want to consider. Um, people in business are busy, and I think just finding time to add this piece is really tricky. Um, we were working primarily with hospitality businesses, and on the opportunity side here, you'll see I listed renovation, and a couple of the partners that we worked with said, you know, I can't do it now, but we're about to do a renovation. We're going to close for two weeks, and we'll do it then. So if you have the opportunity to, if you're already shutting down for inventory or shutting down for some other reason, it might be the time to look at switching your POS system. We did find that with high-end um, restaurants, that the feedback we got was that the e-receipts done on um, phones or on tablets really didn't fit in easily with the culture and the experience they wanted to offer. Um, I know there are other restaurants that are very happily using tablets for e-receipts. I, I heard Olive Garden might be. Um, and I think of other opportunities, um, maybe a simple flip of a feature like Jolene experienced at, at her place. Um, and most of our businesses did actually find that they either saved money, in one case $300 a month for their one register coffee shop, um, or it was cost neutral where their subscription to an e-receipt system, um, those costs were offset by the reduction in paper purchases. So. Just in conclusion, there is potential for pollution prevention and for lowering human exposure to these chemicals through active promotion of these strategies. And so I want to leave you with that and hope that we have inspired at least a couple of you out there to try and take the next step. And I would certainly be happy to talk with anybody about that. Um, if you visit our website, and here's the promise uh, URL, www.pca.state.mn.us backslash receipts. And there you will find um, our latest report. This screenshot is actually a little bit old. Um, we have a toolkit there. If you click on each tab, you'll see uh, frequently asked questions about the paper, some introductory videos about the issues. All the strategies that I mentioned are listed there. Um, you'll see reports. And under that reports tab, you'll also see five case studies of different businesses and their experiences what it costs them, um, and their reductions. The funding tab is no longer there. We had small grants out as part of this project, and we no longer have that funding option. The POS vendors tab lists um, quite a few different vendors um, uh, with different levels of service. So it might give you a place to start for looking for vendors that can provide e-receipt services. And I think that is uh, what I have to share with you today. Um, I do hope that you're inspired to take action. And my name and contact information is right there. And I hope if you have any questions that you'd feel free to call me. Thanks. OK, and we do have a few questions that came in during that last bit. Um, somebody would like to know, are non-phenol phenol options very common for receipt paper suppliers? Becoming more so, um, as the issue has been raised, um, I understand that the price point has come down. Those non-phenol papers do cost more. Um, but I understand from one of the paper distributors here in town that I spoke to last week um, that the price points are coming down. And he said he's moving quite a lot more of those phenol-free papers that he's offering. Um, and the Appian representative that I talked to um, also said that they're seeing increased requests for, um, for their paper. And I should say that I've, I've named a lot of names in this webinar, and the PCA doesn't necessarily support any particular vendor um, or any supplier or any paper. 
Um, so we're just trying to help you find the, the places that might be able to help you. Okay, and then somebody wanted to know if you have any information on the amount of BPA in airline boarding passes. We did not test the boarding passes. There is a study um, that someone else did that calculated, that tested the BPA levels in different kinds of papers, um, different recycled papers, which were minimal, um, and airline boarding passes. So if that person wants to get in touch with me, I can, can get them that link. Okay. My guess is that it would be fairly similar, similar which would be about 1% to 2% of okay. the weight of the paper. Okay. Um, and then we had a comment. Um, somebody said that for us, at least here in Kansas City area, thermal paper isn't recycled and it's frowned on when we try to recycle it. The BPA is transferred, as noted earlier, to other stock that is recyclable. I would just check with people handling your waste stream prior to assuming that thermal paper is recyclable. I think that's a good tip. I think that's a good tip. We did test a couple of recycled content papers that are made locally here um, out of our mixed paper recycling stream to see what was what was coming up in the papers. And because the BPA is water soluble, we think most of the BPA is being washed out in the process water. Um, very, very little of it was showing up. In fact, one of the papers tested for none. Um, one of the papers tested a very, very, very trace amount of BPA in it. Okay. But that's good guidance to check and see if people want the receipts, if your yeah. waste haulers want the receipts in the paper, and recycling or not. And then the person who had asked about transitioning to e-receipts on a university level has left, but... Um, is there anything else that you wanted to add to that? I actually had a couple of um, ways to maybe for people to get started. Um, Go ahead. Okay, yeah. Um, as I was thinking about it, um, it depends on how big your college or university is. But, you know, I think probably first doing an inventory and seeing what operations are actually using BPA um, or thermal receipt paper. Uh, you know, is your university library printing receipts? I know at the University of Illinois we do, and I know that they're using thermal paper. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You know, are is your are your is your food service are your food service people using thermal paper? Is your bookstore use printing receipts on thermal paper? And then, you know, start working. Choose start working with with some of those um, with with each of those units individually to see if you can get them to transition. And my guess is, like with any other sustainability project on a university campus, it's a process. Mm -hmm. And it all depends, that's and it all depends on, on who's involved. Absolutely. And that's what I found, too. It was fairly decentralized, so the bookstore was fairly independent from other operations. Um, I should mention that they also do book rental uh, out of the bookstore, and the rental agreements which were quite long, were all printed on thermal paper receipts. And that's a change that they're making as a result of this project as well. They're transitioning to um, be able to keep those rental agreements all digital. OK. Um, we have one more question. Let's see. The same chemicals are used in deli and bakery labels. Have you? Uh, is there any focus on those? We didn't do any testing of of deli and bakery labels, and it's true there are lots of other adhesive labels that are thermal. Um, I had a concern about our testing vial that we were using to collect our paper samples in because they had a thermal label on them and I was worried about possible contamination in our sampling process and so we had those tested and they actually tested negative negative. Um, and so I think there's probably some variation in how um, how much is in different label um, materials um, and whether sometimes they may be coded or protected because they maybe are um, 
they need to be more durable. And so there may be a protective coating over the BPA also. Um, so I think that's an area ripe for a little bit more investigation. Okay. Well, oh, and what is the cost f for BPA analysis of paper? Um, we were using our Department of Health's environmental lab through the state, um, which were great partners for us. And it cost us about $500 per sample, so per paper that we tested. And I don't know if that's a going market rate or whether they were giving us a deal, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but that's what we were paying. And there are a lot of different um, a lot of different sampling techniques that are in use out there. Um, and if anybody's interested in the details of the sampling and testing analysis that we did, I can send them that. Okay. Okay, I think that takes care of all of our questions. Madeline and Jolene, thank you so much for presenting today. Um, it was very interesting and it and listening to this and actually working with you on organizing this webinar um, has made me think a lot about how I handle receipts when I get them at you know restaurants and stores and stuff like that. So well, great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it makes me worry a little bit. Um, once, once again, the presentation slides are available on the Glipper website's meetings page. The archived webinar will also be available there, um, hopefully today, later today or tomorrow, as well as um, links mentioned during the presentation, and I think really the only one that there was was the EPA report um, that Madeline mentioned, um, besides the the MPCA website, which I already had up there. Um, and that's also available on the website so if anybody's interested. Um, look for a follow-up. Oh, go ahead, Madeline. Sorry. I was just going to say we'll be posting the link to every to all of this as well from our PCA website. Yay. So look for a follow-up email from me tomorrow that will include a link to an evaluation form. Please fill it out and let us know how we're doing. The email is also going to include a link to the archived webinar, which I encourage you to share with your colleagues. And if you're from, um, from a P2 technical assistance program, um, pass it along to your contacts. Or if you're doing any work with retailers, um, you know, let's get the word out about this. Um, we'll also be posting the archived webinar to Glipper's YouTube channel once we get it converted. That usually takes a week or so. Um, so thanks to, again to everybody for joining us today, um, and I hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you so much. Yep. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye-bye.